partnership to help farmers produce more, plus how to stay alert and informed during the hurricane season. And remembering South Africa's freedom fighter extraordinaire, Nelson Mandela. The information is all inside today's edition of Jamaica Magazine. Hello, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Please stay with us. Are you a small to medium-sized tourism enterprise? Borrow up to $25 million at an interest rate of 5%. You can use the funding to develop and maintain your infrastructure, upgrade or increase your capacity, enhance and expand your attraction, tour or event, and purchase raw material. Call the Exim Bank and ask about the Tourism SNTE loan. Their numbers are 876-630-1400 or 876-618-5889. Tap into the over $3 billion U.S. dollars earned yearly through tourism with a SMTE loan. Good day, I'm Theodore Henry, and this is your JIS News for Thursday, July 18. A drought alleviation program is being prepared for cabinet approval. Minister of Portfolio and the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Daryl Vaz, told Parliament on Tuesday that moderate to severe drought was affecting almost 70% of the country. He said the drought was being exacerbated by extreme heat, with data collected from weather stations across the 14 parishes showing higher temperatures in June when compared to the same period last year. He added that the Met Service's most recent seasonal climate forecast model for up to September indicated that temperatures were likely to remain hotter than usual with near normal to below normal rainfall. Given all that is happening, Mr. Speaker, the Climate Change Division of my ministry has been proactive and ensuring that we take the necessary and concrete steps to make the island climate resilient. The CCB has entirely developed mechanisms to remove barriers and unlock financing for private sector engagement in climate action. Meanwhile, the Meteorological Service and the Water Resources Authority, WRA, are teaming up to ensure Jamaica is better able to coordinate efforts and plan for climate change impacts. The entities signed a Memorandum of Understanding yesterday to share hydrometeorological data for early warning systems. This covers real-time stream flow and rainfall information on a new data-gathering platform made possible with funds from the pilot program for climate resilience. The Met Service and WRA will also share technical expertise for capacity building and established committees and working groups to allow for speedy data access and transfer. Minister Without Portfolio and the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Pernell Charles Jr., says the partnership will advance Jamaica's efforts to build resilience. One of the important steps is for us to improve our capacity to collect and collate climate data. Is that the correct wording? That's right. Um, as well as for us to improve the information management and the early warning capabilities. The Jamaica Fire Brigade has received more than $30 million of equipment to strengthen its first responder services. The items were donated through the United States Southern Command Humanitarian Assistance Program Office. They include 42 fire proximity suits, 244 fire proximity gloves, 27 fire boots, 10 coveralls, and 360 bed nets, as well as cots, axes, shovels, rakes, and two large military-grade tents. These will be distributed to the 34 fire stations across the island. But it is of importance that when we ask the men and women of the Jamaica Fire Brigade to put their lives on the line that we do so by providing the necessary equipment to make them perform their duties. Charles Affairs of the U.S. Embassy, Eric Kant, says his government remains a committed partner in strengthening Jamaica's capacity to counter man-made and natural disasters. The United States believes in Jamaica's future and we are committed to working with Jamaica, Jamaican partners as well as international partners to ensure when a disaster strikes, Jamaica is fully prepared to manage that disaster and minimize the level of devastation. 
Labour and Social Security Minister Shahini Robinson is reassuring beneficiaries of the Path Back to School grant that they will receive their benefit payments electronically next month. As promised last year, we will facilitate direct ele electronic transfers of benefit payments commencing with the August 2019 payment. This will represent a saving on both sides as well as being more discreet and convenient for the families. Over $500 million is projected to be spent this fiscal year in providing back-to-school grants for students on the program of advancement through health and education. The initiative started in September 2018. Meanwhile, 800 PATH households will benefit this year from upskilling, while another 600 will be engaged in on-the-job training under the Steps to Work program. Labor and Social Security Minister Shahini Robinson gave the update during her recent sectoral presentation in Parliament. She said these interventions were intended to make persons economically independent. As part of that, a further 1,100 PATH beneficiaries will receive financial assistance to establish micro-businesses. Our aim is to ultimately empower persons from the program who no longer qualify for benefits. This on-the-job training is intended to ensure their financial and social stability. If you don't put them in this position of independence, then they will again become dependent on the state for social protection. The minister added that this year also, PATH will engage 500 families in educational sessions on nutrition, child discipline, budgeting and parenting. It will target parents with children aged 2 to 6 years. And finally, more audiovisual equipment are to be installed in courthouses across the island in the coming weeks. The disclosure was made by Minister of Justice Delroy Chuck as he addressed the official opening of a new justice centre in Santa Cruz recently. He says this is to eventually facilitate a paperless court system and help with delays in the justice system. One of the targets we've been working on for the last couple of years is for the audiovisual equipment to be handed over to the Chief Justice and the judges. And what this audiovisual equipment or the process means that when you, you are in court, everything that is said or done will be recorded and kept for posterity. He says the audiovisual equipment will also allow vulnerable witnesses to give testimonies from a secluded location. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Theodore Henry. Thanks for watching. Nutritious food, succulent dishes, superior workmanship, and excellent service. Jamaica is on the go. Let's grow what we eat and eat what we grow. Let's harness the indomitable spirit of our most valued resource, our people. Let's support our local businesses. After all, buying Jamaican means building Jamaica. The Ministry of Agriculture continues to help farmers produce at maximum capacity with assistance from its partners. It is one initiative that is helping those who produce potato. Getting farmers to produce more, adopting best practice methods, and becoming more efficient and sustainable. The Ministry of Industry, Commerce, Agriculture and Fisheries has aligned itself with partners to grow the agriculture sector. One of those partners is the World University Service of Canada, WUSC Caribbean. They have been providing resources and technical support to small and medium-scale producers in order to boost agricultural outputs in five targeted crops. These are Irish and sweet potato, onion, ginger and sweet yam. The work is being done through the promotion of regional opportunities for produce through Enterprises and Linkages Propel project. The five-year project, which started in 2013, also provides assistance to establish market linkages. We want holistic, integrated approaches between all the different actors in the marketplace. Propel as a, as a support entity, um, helping farmers to produce and also to produce quality products, um, has helped us as a marketing company to be able to push um, 
marketable goods into the um, supermarkets, the wholesales, um, into the restaurant areas, in, in, into food service, um, into hot, in hotel industry. We are targeting a total of 5,000 farmers in Jamaica by the end of the project. We are very close to 3,000 and we are profiling all those farmers. By the end of March next year, we hope to have about 3,500. And by 2018, when we leave, about 5,000. Jamaica is one of five Caribbean countries where the $1.9 billion project is being implemented. The others are Barbados, Dominica, Guyana, and St. Lucia. To help them care for the crops, farmers are given training in when to spray, what chemical to use, and how to protect themselves. The day you plant your potatoes, you'll have spent 70% of all your money. And if you don't care it well for the next 12 weeks, you could lose everything. The training has also built the capacity of farmers who are now providing the service to other farms. We were able to provide nine of these guys with pumps, overalls, water boots, and they're now spraying and running their own business, providing service to the other farmers. Training was provided by the Rural Agricultural Development Authority and Level 1 certification by the Heart Trust NTA. I love it. I feel like a professional already. <laughs> you understand? So I just wanted to take each step at a time and go forward. Through the Propel project, farmers are introduced to new technologies that will allow them to reduce production cost, become more efficient, and produce more. This includes plastic mulch, which is a weed control method, and micro greenhouse technology applications. Manual reaping time of potato will also reduce significantly with the introduction of a harvesting machine. From what I'm seeing, it is quite satisfactory to me because it is my intention now to make sure I get one of these machines because I'll be able to plant more potato and I would see a better income for myself. Minister Without Portfolio in the Agriculture Ministry, J.C. Hutchinson, was in Manchester for the demonstration of the harvesting machine and acknowledged the work being carried out under the Propel project. It's one where I think we are going to have to look to see if we can expand that, we get more equipment like that. This technology here is one where you see that it not only facilitates the uh, cutting down and the growth of weeds, uh, which also eliminates quite a lot of the labor. And by doing that, you are also putting more money in your pocket. The area of research and development is also being strengthened under the Propel project. In May 2016, a Memorandum of Understanding was signed between World University Service of Canada, WUSC, and the Scientific Research Council, SRC. That agreement will build the SRC's capacity to produce clean planting materials for Irish potato, ginger, sweet yam, and sweet potato. The agency will be able to supply farmers and companies with virus-free plants and to identify and analyze natural predation for biological control of pests and diseases. There is also partnership with Bodle's research station for clean planting materials for ginger. By bringing the different stakeholders on board, the project is creating a sustainable output of planting materials to aid farmers in their production, which should ultimately lead to a steady distribution of produce. We target the sector. We don't target farmers in particular. We provide stimulus, we provide catalyst to the entire sector for it to move from where it is to where it would like to be. So we don't talk about Propel without talking about SRC, without talking about Bodles, without talking about the Ministry of Agriculture, without talking about um, RADA. Mr. Prasad says he is pleased with the strides Jamaica has made with the project. I'm really very satisfied. Jamaica, for our 80, uh, $87 million that has been contributed so far, I think Jamaica has contributed close to $40 million of that. I mean, I don't have the exact figure, but in terms of production that has reached the high-value market, Jamaica has contributed close to, close to $40 million of that. In terms of research and development, in terms of linkages, in terms of getting all people on board to say how do we solve the issues, Jamaica is way ahead of the game. It's time to familiarize yourself with terms issued by the Met Office during a hurricane or heavy rainfall. Remember, knowledge is power.
every month of the year, there has been in our history some incidents of flooding that has taken place in some aspect of the country. And that is something that we have to take note of. Apart from monitoring and giving the forecast, we are also responsible for warnings. And so there are some warnings that we want you to take special heed to if you consider yourself to be vulnerable in any situation. When we speak about a flash flood watch, it means that there is a feature, some kind of weather system that is going to produce enough rainfall that makes it possible for you to get flooding. So it means start to watch because the water levels are going to be increasing and there is the possibility of the flooding. Now, if we start to see that in some area, flooding has started to occur, or if we believe that the flooding has been so close to an area that it is going to happen in that area in a short space of time, we will escalate that flash flood watch and refer to it as a flash flood warning. So when we talk about a flash flood warning, it means not only that the flooding is possible, but the flooding either has already started to happen or is going to happen in a very short space of time because it is very close to that area. So it is important to know what the watch means as opposed to what the warning means. Usually with the warning, we will not only issue a warning, but we will also tell you what kind of actions are important or what you should not do. Like do not go through flooded waterways because it could pose a risk to your life and to your property. Also, if you live in low-lying or flood-prone areas, if it is an area that is regularly experiencing flooding, a flash flood warning for your area would mean that now is the time to move to higher ground because the flooding has already started or is going to happen very shortly. It is also important for us to know where we live because sometimes in our messages we might not refer to the actual town but we will tell you what part of the country the flood watch or the flood warning is relevant to. So if we talk about central parishes, we are referring to Clarendon. We're also talking about Manchester. We're also talking about St. Anne. These are central parishes. So you have to be knowledgeable of where you live so that you know whether the message actually applies to you. The messages that we issue for hurricanes and tropical storms are watches and warnings as well, like the flooding. But in this case, for a tropical storm or a hurricane, when we issue a watch, it means the conditions that are associated with the storm or the hurricane are possible within a certain time frame. If you hear tropical storm or hurricane watch, you could get the impact of that system within a day and a half, 36 hours. If we mention that it is a tropical storm or a hurricane warning, it means that you only have one day before that thing can affect you. So we are moving to how quickly you need to make sure that you are prepared by naming it a watch or a warning. So the watch is the first level of the alert that there is something that is likely to affect you. But when we move to a warning, it means now is the time to batten down because you most likely are going to experience that storm or hurricane. We might have a tropical wave, which is the least of, the, of, of them in that it can still cause a lot of rain and it can still cause flooding and devastation, but it will not have very strong winds associated with it. But then there is the tropical depression that is a little stronger because now you have winds that are moving with it, gusty winds, and it also has a lot of rainfall. Then you have tropical storms, which is a more severe kind of tropical depression because the winds are even stronger. And then if it gets even stronger, it could become a hurricane. So it's important that you have your radio and that your radio is battery controlled, not dependent on electricity, so that you can hear the warning messages that come from the meteorological service. Also bear in mind that if you dial 116, you will be able to hear the latest message coming out of the meteorological service related to any warnings. We cannot stop paying attention. We cannot let down our guard. You have to prepare yourself and stay prepared until we are out of the threat.
Today being Nelson Mandela International Day is set aside to remember the late freedom fighters' achievements in seeking to secure conflict resolution, democracy, human rights, peace and reconciliation. This year's theme is Take Action, Inspire Change, Make Every Day a Mandela Day. The day is also used to highlight his triumphant release after 26 years in prison for speaking out against injustices to his fellow countrymen. On July 18, 1918, the son of a Tembu chief was born in a small village in the Transkei province of eastern South Africa. He was christened Nelson Rolihala Mandela. As a young boy, he enjoyed farming and engaged in other boyish pursuits. His schooling, right up to the time at the University of Fort Hare, was a first for any member of his family. Other firsts would be logged. And the catalyst might have come in 1939, when, in an attempt to escape an arranged marriage, Mandela moved to Johannesburg, bringing him face to face with the system he would dedicate his life to fighting. It's a system of racial oppression, uh, in which basically uh, the majority of, the, of South Africans of, uh, were disenfranchised they were denied all kinds of rights, political, economic, social rights. This um, obviously was exercised by a white minority regime against, not just against black South Africans who were the majority of the population, but also against colors, which are known, that's how they know in South Africa, but it's mixed people and also against Asians, or people of uh, Asian origin. The system of racial segregation, apartheid, existed in South Africa from as early as 1910. It was made more formal and more widespread with the victory of the National Party in 1948. Earlier, in 1943, Mandela joined the African National Congress, ANC, and through it, the struggle against apartheid. Mandela and the ANC engaged in passive resistance to the segregated policies until later being forced into armed struggle, prompting a government ban on ANC activities. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. Mandela's actions were not overlooked. In 1962, he was captured escaped and went into hiding. Two years later, he was recaptured and sentenced to life imprisonment. From behind the bars forged from apartheid, Mandela continued the fight. Inspired by his stance behind those bars, the movement found new energy. The leadership of ANC is going to decide that they're going to make Nelson Mandela the icon of this struggle against apartheid. And that's when they started the campaign, Free Mandela, the Free, Cam um, Free Mandela campaign. And, and the struggle against apartheid became much more popular, not just in South Africa, but elsewhere, in particular in, in Western Europe and North America. Uh, everybody came to know the, the sufferings and the, and, and the injustices that, South, that black South Africans uh, were undergoing through the face of Mandela and through this campaign to liberate and to free uh, Nelson Mandela. The strategy was successful, and worldwide sanctions against South Africa, coupled with widespread resistance within its borders, eventually forced the government to rethink its apartheid policies. Mandela was released in 1990 after successful negotiations with the white government, led at the time by Frederick Willem de Klerk. Within months of his release, he was able to convince the government to establish a multiracial democracy in the country. He was elected leader of the ANC in 1991. Then, in 1994, the inmate from cell 46664 made the transition from prisoner to president when the ANC won South Africa's first democratic elections and Nelson Mandela was named president. Our emotion said the white minority is an enemy. We must never talk with them. But our brain said, if you don't talk with this man, your country will go up in flames. And 
for many years to come, this country will be engulfed in rivers of blood. So we had to reconcile that conflict. Mandela and de Klerk shared the 1993 Nobel Peace Prize for their work in ending apartheid and laying the foundation for a democratic South Africa. The fact that he uh, was for, um, for a multiracial South Africa uh, and that he was very convinced about it and that he was able to convince uh, all the anti-apartheid organizations that that was the, the way to go, that the future of South Africa had to be a multiracial South Africa that also made the negotiations uh, successful because if, um, if ANC had been more radical or if they had antagonized uh, the South African government, perhaps there's, I mean, very likely the South African government, government would not have given up so many things and probably they were, uh, we wouldn't be talking about successful negotiations, perhaps we would be talking about uh, a civil war. Mandela spent a single term in office from 1994 to 1999. Besides his role as freedom fighter and statesman, Mandela was also a family man. He fathered six children and was married three times. The first marriage, a 13-year union with Evelyn Mace, ended in 1957. Mandela married Winnie Medikazela in 1958. During that nearly 40-year union, Winnie became a global symbol of activism, carrying on the struggle for freedom while Mandela remained in prison. The union, however, didn't last, and they divorced in 1996. Mandela remarried again in 1998 to Grace and Michelle. During his presidency, Nelson Mandela sought to establish diplomatic ties between South Africa and other nations. Jamaica was among those countries he engaged, officially establishing diplomatic relations on September 9, 1994, three years after his first visit to the island. To acknowledge his work, an honorary degree was conferred on him by the University of the West Indies and the Nelson Mandela Park in Halfway Tree and Mandela Highway in St. Catherine were renamed in his honor. During Nelson Mandela's tenure as president, South Africa and Jamaica explored bilateral relationships, mainly in the areas of education and human resource development. Negotiations for the establishment of a South African diplomatic mission to Jamaica came to fruition in 2000. Jamaica's high commission in that country was opened six years later. Cooperation between both countries continued even after Mandela retired from public life. Had it not been for the bravery and determination of Nelson Mandela and other anti-apartheid campaigners, South Africa might have remained isolated with few allies and opportunities for cooperation with other countries. Not only did he bring about freedom for black South Africans, but Mandela also put his country back on the road to economic prosperity. As we close today's show, we ask that you stay connected via our website, jis.gov.jm. And while you're online, send your feedback to Jamaica Magazine at jis.gov.jm or via tweet at JIS News. On behalf of the entire production crew, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Do take care. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.